Melissa Arcan to today's talk. And Melissa, I'll ask you to share your screen with us and I will turn off my microphone and my camera. Great, thanks so much, Tom. Thanks for that, that introduction. And let me just get my screen sharing going here uh, and then we'll get started. All right, so hopefully everyone can see that okay and hear me okay. I can hear you and I can see your titles shot on your PowerPoint, Melissa, so go ahead. Awesome, thanks, Tom. Um, all right, well, really pleased to be here and, and thanks, Annette, for extending the invitation to participate in the convention today. And I hope you all are, have been having a good, um, a good couple of days here. And so as, as Tom had mentioned in, in the introduction uh, of me, thank you, Tom, um, is that my research program uh, is really focused in on looking at how uh, crop roots and soils interact together. And ultimately, I'm really interested in um, studying how how those processes, those interactions can improve crop nutrition and nutrient use efficiency, but as well as the important role that roots play in formation and stabilization of, of soil organic matter. And I just want to remind everyone, you know, when you think about our Saskatchewan agricultural soils that are, you know, these beautiful, rich in organic matter, chernozemic soils, um, you know, that organic matter is really derived from the continuous inputs of, um, of root material from those native grasslands that had been growing and, you know, established over, over 10,000 years. And so I just want to remind everyone that, you know, the importance of roots um, has always been there. And it's only in really the last number of, of decades that scientists have been able to understand roots a lot better so that we can start to harness um, their power in, in much more productive ways. So I'm going to focus in my talk today um, more specifically on crop uh, crop roots and, and some of the work that I've been doing in collaboration with crop breeders. Uh, and so looking at both soil organic carbon and, and organic matter as a result, and then also looking at nitrogen use efficiency. So I always like to show this image. Um, this picture on the right was actually published by a University of Saskatchewan researcher um, at the name of Pavlachenko, and this is actually from back in 1937. And he was a pioneer in root research. And, and this particular image shows the root systems of Marquis wheat, uh, which, is, which is on the left, and then uh, wild mustard, which is on, on the right. And obviously these root systems are quite different. They're really extensive and they're also reaching depths um, of, of quite a quite a substantial depth. And for those of you who've been in the egg college and, and hopefully for those of us that can return to the egg college one day, um, on the fourth floor there is um, an amazing uh, root system of a crested wheatgrass that is much taller than myself and and that would have been that root system would have been excavated during um, by Pavlachenko's team uh, back in the 1930s. But what I want to focus in on here is that even back in 1937, Pavlachenko was stating that for the last two centuries, strenuous efforts have been made to un unveil the underground picture of plant life. And 80 years later, there's still a lot that we don't know about the hidden half of the plant. And so what I'm going to talk about today is highlight some of the ways in which we've advanced our understanding, um, but that there's still uh, many, many aspects around um, how roots function and how they interact with the soil um, to, to better understand how, you know, how do crops respond to stress like drought and disease. And how do roots respond to resource availability like water and nutrients? And we can't really get a full picture of how crops respond to these things without looking um, also at the roots uh, and, and focusing only on the above ground components. So roots and soils interact in a number of ways. And of course, you know, the most obvious, the most common, commonly understood way in which roots and soils interact is that roots extract resources from soil. Roots get their nutrients from the soil and uh, their water from the soil. Um, and 
And something else to, to consider here, though, is that root, root systems are incredibly plastic. They can respond to changes in climate and soil conditions, um, and especially nutrient and water availability. So this photo here, it's a classic example from a, from a hydroponic study uh, in Barley here, um, published in the 1970s. Um, but what, it's, what it really clearly demonstrates is that plants will partition their resources towards root production in response to various forms of stimulus, in this case, various forms of nutrients. So we have really subtle changes in soil conditions can have actually quite profound consequences for root system architecture, architecture even within a single plant species. And so, you know, that's one way that roots and soils interact. Um, the probably less obvious way that roots and soils interact is that roots are actually a source of resource to the soil. So materials from, from the root system itself get input into the soil. And what these, what these root inputs can do is actually a number of things. Um, so roots can release exudates um, and rhizodeposits and root systems, they die, parts of the root system might die, and that root input can, um, can, can provide both fuel and nutrients for the soil micro, microbial community. And in fact, about 20 to 50% of the total amount of carbon that plants will, will photosynthesize and, and fix, they'll allocate towards their root systems. And a good portion of that carbon um, is also released to the soil while the plant is actually still alive through root exudation, through rhizodeposition. Okay, so well, why would plants release, you know, that hard-earned um, carbon? Why would they release release root exudates and rhizodeposits to the soil? Um, you know, why would they expend that energy? Well, they do this because these root exudates can actually serve multiple beneficial functions directly for the plant. Um, so the, again, they serve as both fuel and nutrients for soil microorganisms, and those organisms could potentially enhance nutrient mineralization. They, of course, they act as signals to important symbionts like rhizobia, for example, uh, and as well as some root exudates can facilitate nutrient mobilization. For example, the solubilization of, of insoluble, otherwise insoluble forms of phosphorus that can enhance phosphorus availability. Um, but root exudates can also serve functions beyond just supporting plant growth, and this can um, this can improve overall soil health. So, for example, root exudates can improve um, increased aggregation. Root systems can improve uh, aggregation and soil organic matter formation. And so, there are quite a number of functions that root inputs can actually serve um, to the soil system that then can feed back and provide benefits to the overall crop productivity and, and the overall um, agro-ecosystem. Agro so what is also critical here that I'm gonna talk a little bit more about in some of the research that I've been doing is that um, root exudates also play a really important role in recruiting the soil microorganisms that actually associate with the plant. Um, and so we are learning a lot more about how this sort of recruitment can happen um, in, in ways in which that we can hopefully then uh, fine tune that to be able to provide growth benefits to, to crops. So I'm going to introduce uh, the concept of the rhizosphere. I'm sure some of you have heard this term before, uh, but for those that haven't, the rhizosphere refers to that zone of soil that is under the influence of the roots of living plants. So this is where that dynamic interplay between roots and soil resources occur. So here in the rhizosphere, there's anywhere between two uh, to 10 times more microorganisms than in the surrounding bulk soil that isn't under the soil that's not under the influence of roots. And there can be dynamic, um, both abiotic and biotic functional zones that encompass the rhizosphere that can overlap. Um, but again, what's key here is that this is where roots can fuel and recruit beneficial microorganisms and that the processes that occur within the rhizosphere can have um, sort of wide reaching implications to even climate and environmental change as they affect, for example, greenhouse gas emissions and soil carbon sequestration. 
They can affect soil fertility, disease protection, crop production, and then of course, ultimately food security. Um, you know, it's a really small zone of soil, but it's it sort of punches above its weight in terms of the, the speed at which, um, you know, some of these processes can occur. And so as soil scientists um, working with with you know crop scientists and crop breeders, what we're really interested in is is really harnessing and understanding those those processes for the benefit of our agricultural systems. So, you know, my, the title of my talk relates to root form, uh, function, and fate. And what I mean by root form is, you know, what are what are the the attributes? What are the traits of roots um, that are actually important? And and in terms of of influencing soil processes like nitrogen cycling, for example. So we can look more closely at how we actually characterize different plant root traits. So root traits can be broadly described by their architectural and morphological traits. So this is this is simply, you know, what do the roots look like? How are they spatially arranged in the soil? Um, but root traits can also be described by their physiological traits. So this can include things like root respiration, like um, nutrient nitrogen content, nutrient uptake, um, as well as root exudation. And then of course, there's also biotic traits. So these traits can include um, specific microorganisms that might inhabit the root surface that could either be beneficial or pathogenic. Uh, as well as the broader rhizosphere and root microbiome. But again, as a soil scientist, what I'm interested in examining is how these different root traits can influence important soil functions. So to sort of break down what some of the soil functions that, that I'm interested in studying, um, there's this sort of handy table that was first published by Richard Bargett uh, quite a number of years ago now. And what he did is he compiled data from papers that examined the effects of specific root traits on different soil processes. And this gives us a clearer idea of where our understanding has improved and where there's still lots of gaps. So just to walk you through this graphic, um, what we've got here are different traits in each row. So we've got architectural traits such as root length density, rooting depth, morphological and different biotic traits as well. Um, and so the way that this graphic works is that we also then have different soil functions or processes that are on sort of the top uh, described in these different columns. So we've got functions related to soil carbon cycling. So, um, you know, the amount of carbon that's put into the soil decomposition and then in terms of nutrient cycling, again, the amount of nutrients that may, might be input into the soil. Um, nutrient mineralization, plant nitrogen uptake, and then other um, soil processes related to soil structure. So structural stability like re erosion resistance, porosity, and aggregate formation. And so how to interpret this is that the darker the color, the more research there's been done in this area. And the direction of the ar arrow indicates um, the relationship between the root trait and a soil process. So for example, if we look at root length density, um, if we look at, let's say, for example, carbon cycling and inputs, we know that a higher root length density um, translates into a higher input of carbon. That's, you know, somewhat intuitive. Um, and then, you know, there's been a lot, lot of research that has been done that has, you know, sort of supported that um, that that knowledge and that relationship. But there are some other areas here where there's question marks where it's not certain exactly what the relationship is between the, the specific root trait and that particular um, soil function. And, and so, for example, um, if we look at uh, physiological root traits like root nitrogen content, how does that relate to actually um, benefits to plant nitrogen uptake? And there's actually you know less re less research that's been done in terms of how some of these root traits can affect um, structural uh, structural processes within the soil, and especially um, a very large gap in understanding in how pathogens might influence these different soil processes. And so, what my goal in with my research is to start to fill in some of these gaps and to clarify some of the uncertainties surrounding the effects of root traits on soil processes. 
So turning towards my research now, um, one of the overriding questions that my program is seeking to answer is, so how do variations in root forms, so root traits, whether they're structural, physiological, or biotic, as well as their interactions will affect soil functions? And these soil functions that I'm in, within my research program um, that I'm looking at are those that are important for soil carbon sequestration, which relates to soil organic matter formation, and especially how nitrogen cycling and availability can affect crop production. Now, something that I haven't talked about uh, yet is that my work also focuses on the fate of carbon and nitrogen from root exudates and rise of deposits within and through the soil system. So what do I mean by fate? Why would that be important? So for example, how much root derived carbon will contribute to soil organic matter? As well as, for example, how much nitrogen in legume roots can contribute to the nitrogen fertility of crops, either within a rotation or with an intercrop partner? And so finally, other work that, um, that I've been involved with also examines how root derived carbon and nitrogen can actually be lost from soil systems as greenhouse gas emissions, either as carbon dioxide or nitrous oxide. But ultimately, um, the focus on, of my work is on that dynamic interplay between roots and soil. So what are some of the tools that we now have that you know, 80 years ago, Pavlochenko may not have, have had access to. So we're still very much relying on just the simple, you know, shovel and um, the strong backs of summer students to, to extract roots from soil. But we also have other technologies such as stable isotopes that can be used to trace carbon and nitrogen compounds into plant tissues and then into the roots and then finally into the soil. And so this can tell us how much root derived nitrogen and carbon was released to the soil as, where, as well as where it goes in various carbon and nitrogen pools within the soil and how it might escape as maybe greenhouse gas emissions. We can also use different um, soil biochemistry techniques. So we can look at soil enzyme assays that get us a better understanding of how soil nutrients and carbon might mineralize, might transform. And what is especially exciting right now are the advances in soil microbiology, so including uses of biomarker and molecular techniques that enable us to understand who is involved in processing root inputs and who is involved in forming relationships with crop roots. And finally, we now have much more advanced root imaging techniques that allow for relatively easy scanning and image processing uh, of roots. And we can do this using flatbed scanners, um, but as well as um, cameras and imaging systems that can be actually installed directly in the field where we can, we can image roots that are growing in situ. And in addition to this, uh, just recently, um, uh, the University of Saskatchewan uh, on our campus, we have access to the cyclotron. And the cyclotron essentially enables us to image roots using um, using radio isotopes. And, and so myself and my colleague, Dr. Eric Lamb, have just started a research project where we're using um, the cyclotron to, to image different uh, wheat varieties and the response to, um, to nitrogen availability. So we, we, we're kind of in an exciting time for root and soil research. And so there's been a lot of advance, advances um, in the last couple of decades in this area and, and still a, a huge amount of growth that can, that can occur in the future. So with these new technologies, um, as I mentioned, there has been an increase in research related to roots as well as soil processes. And more and more this research is being um, sort of developed in order to understand crop development um, and, and, and improve crop breeding. And so there's been a lot of research, especially um, in the US uh, on crops such as maize and wheat. Um, but I'm gonna talk about sort of two different broad categories of, of studies that have been undertaken that really look at roots, soil processes, as well as crop breeding. So the first group that I'm gonna talk about um, looks at how crop breeding has inadvertently changed roots and below ground traits. So for example, crop, crops have been bred with you know, an obvious focus on increasing above ground traits like yield um, or grain and forage quality. And, and these, these 
these breeding program programs are often conducted under, you know, maybe high fertility or without really considering um, the soil processes directly. And so there's been some questions about how these approaches has pot have a pen potentially affected root systems and related soil processes. So that's one sort of broad category of, you know, root soil and, and crop breeding type research. The second group that I'm going to talk about um, takes more of a reverse perspective and really focuses on how we can better exploit roots and below ground traits to improve crop productivity. And so this can be related to crop nutrition or drought and disease tolerance, uh, but I'm going to specifically talk uh, about nitrogen here in, in some of the examples of the research that I've been doing most recently. Uh, so first going to start by providing an example of that that first kind of group of, of the kinds of studies where you know crop breeding might have had an inadvertent effect on uh, below ground traits um, and as well as soil processes. So my MSc student, uh, Fariza Lalani, she examined roots and below ground traits of zero tan and lentils. Now, just as a background, uh, consumer preference for fast cooking and light colored pulses has driven the development of so-called zero tannin lentil varieties. And so these varieties are selectively bred uh, through the alteration of a biochemical pathway, it's the phenylpropanoid pathway. And essentially what happens is that changes to this pathway will alter tannin synthesis. We basically reduce tannin, tannin synthesis, so we don't have a high concentration of tannins in the seeds. And so this will um, affect the chemical characteristics across the plant. So it'll include the content of lignin um, and other phenolic compounds like flavanols and phenolic acids that are present within these plant tissues. Now, research out of pulse breeder Bert Vanden Vandenberg's group uh, showed that the polyphenol profile of the root exudates of these zero tannin lentil cultivars were quite a bit different than the normal tannin type lentils. And if we look even at the, the image, the photo here uh, of the lentil plants that are growing, we can actually distinguish the result of differences in, um, in, in the phenolic content of these plants just by looking at the color of the stems. So the regular um, tannin containing normal varieties of, of lentil, actually the stems look red in color, whereas the zero tannin lentils um, don't have any of that reddish color. They look more green in color. And so even just subtle differences um, that are targeted to change the, the um, the quality of, of the seed can have cascading effects to other parts of the plant. Now, why might you know we care about this um, at all? And, and one of the reasons that we might care about this is that if we've changed the profile of these root exudates, and since root exudates play a critical role in recru recruitment of soil microorganisms that are important for soil carbon cycling, um, as well as other soil functions like disease suppression, we wanted to know whether subtle differences in plant biochemical characteristics that come about uh, due to crop breeding would affect soil microbial communities and their function. So what did Faye do to investigate this? So she took advantage of uh, stable isotope labeling using carbon-13. And what she did is she grew the zero tannin and the normal uh, lentil cultivars in a growth chamber and exposed the plants to C13 labeled carbon dioxide. The plants can take in that C13 labeled carbon dioxide through photosynthesis, so completely through a, a natural, natural pathway. And then what she could do is she could trace that carbon into the roots and ultimately into the soil and soil microbial community. Um, and so she was able to be able to distinguish between uh, how the, the, the lentil cultivars actually influence the soil microbial community as well as carbon allocation below ground. So what did she find? So the graphs here on the right hand side um, indicate the abundance of PLFA, um, which is basically um, an, an indicator of the living viable microbial biomass. 
So in this top left hand corner here, we have total microbial abundance. And then the other panels to the right and below indicate the abundance of specific microbial groups. So we've got bacteria, fungi, gram negative and gram positive bacteria and actinobacteria. And then on the right hand side is the fungal to bacterial ratios. So what she found is that um, the microbial abundance was greater under the normal uh, tannin containing cultivars and that biomass was actually decreased under the zero tannin lentils and that was that was true across the different microbial functional groups. And so she found that indeed the zero tannin lines supported less microbial biomass in the rhizosphere. But what she also found is that it had impacts on carbon cycling. So she found that the zero tannin lentils supported higher carbon cycling um, activity within the rhizosphere, which has the potential then to, um, to potentially disturb and, and result in losses of carbon under these, under these plants. Um, and she also found that the microbial communities were different between the structure of those communities were different um, under the zero tannin compared to the tannin containing lentils. Now, one thing that she found as well is she measured root biomass and she was able to quantify how much carbon was being input between the two different um, land, or tannin, or sorry, two different lentil um, types. And what she found is that the differences actually couldn't be explained by amounts of carbon or root that was input into the soil, but rather the quality, the chemical characteristics of those root inputs were what were driving differences between the zero tannin versus the tannin containing lentils. So what are some of the implications of some of this work? Well, number one, at least within a short term, within the, the, the time period that, this, that these plants are growing, this can have implications for soil carbon dynamics. So if one, one plant um, potentially accelerates carbon mineralization, we could have potential losses of carbon in, you know, in the short term. And that might be small amounts within a, a singular growing season, but, um, but what I want to highlight is the fact that we can have even small differences in carbon allocation and carbon cycling that can occur even within, um, within a crop species. But probably at least in the, the larger implications of this work to, uh, to crop production is that what we found is that changes in microbial structure can, can alter potentially other important uh, soil functions that are important for crop production. In this case, probably disease suppression or disease protection might be something that we will want to look forward into the future because previous research has shown that um, some of these phenolic compounds are actually really important in terms of inhibiting um, growth of pathogens. So there's, there's some outstanding questions that have come about as part of this work. So moving on now um, to some other work that I've been invol involved with as part of a larger research project. Um, and this larger research project um, sort of addresses this broader question of how rhizosphere microbiomes, so the microbial community associated with, with plant roots, might be shaped among different cultivars. And so this was a project that's been spearheaded by Dr. Steve Siciliano and Bobby Helgeson from the Department of Soil Science here at the U of S. Um, and so we've been working with crop breeders and really trying to understand if there's a core or a signature um, a group of microorganisms that associate with the roots of Brassica napis. Uh, and the point here is that we want to see if we can actually harness that microbiome um, through breeding initiatives. So PhD student Zalalem Tai, he showed that they were were in fact core microbiota, so similar microorganisms that were found among 16 different diverse canola genotypes, um, and, and that, but that there were also some differences among them. And so this work is important because number one, it identified the potential for targeting soil microbiomes for breeding, but, but again, there's some gaps that there's some questions that are still outstanding because we don't have a full picture of what benefits these microbiomes could actually confer to canola. Many of the microorganisms that were detected um, within the canola, within the rhizospheres of these different canola genotypes 
have been shown to be able to provide and promote plant growth, but it isn't clear yet if if these um, these are actually providing those specific benefits to these different genotypes. So something within this project, looking at canola roots, um, something that was clearly evident was that not only were the rhizosphere microbiomes different among the crop genotypes, but the structure and the architecture of the roots were as well. So with these clear visual indications of differences, my PhD student, Shanae Williams, is working to understand whether or not there's differences in soil nutrient cycling processes that might enable improved nutrition. So we're really trying to tackle whether these biotic and structural root traits will impact um, nutrient uptake uh, and, and availability. So what this is showing is some, some data from Shanae's um, study. So this was a field-based study um, just outside of, of Saskatoon at the Llewellyn Research uh, Station. And she was looking at um, eight different canola lines that was part of the microbiome work that Zalalem published. And what Shanae did is she collected rhizosphere soils at various stages of plant growth. So coinciding with the vegetative stage with flowering and pod filling. And she found variations in both soil nitrogen mineralization as well as nitrification over time, but also differences in soil mineralization of nitrogen among the different canola genotypes. Um, so one thing that she found was that the canola breeding line, so we've got different, um, each different marker is a different canola variety, a different line. Um, she found that the canola line NAM32 had both the highest nitrogen mineralization rate and um, statistically highest, and then at least numerically um, higher rate of nitrification. Um, and so what this is indicating is that there are variations in nitrogen cycling processes among the different genotypes. And so what Shanae also did is she collected the roots from these different genotypes within the field and she washed the roots and then she scanned the roots using a WinRISO flatbed scanner and to look at different um, root architectural traits. And what she found is that NAM32, which had the highest rates of nitrogen cycling, also had the highest root diameter and root surface area. And so now what she's doing is she's working to relate the rhizosphere microbiome data that Zalalem uncovered and to see if these, um, these soil nitrogen cycling processes are related to the microbiome um, as well as these root architectural traits. Uh, really trying to understand the relationship among these factors for improved nutrient cycling and soil fertility. Now, all of this work um, has, has really dovetailed into a current research project uh, that I'm involved with, and that's funded by the Canadian Agricultural Partnership, as well as the um, canola industry. And this is focused specifically on improving nitrogen use efficiency in canola. And so this work is actually being led by um, Sally Vale, who's a canola breeder out of the Saskatoon Research Station here at, um, at Agriculture Agri-Food Canada. And it includes a really big team of collaborators, including myself, um, Reynold Lemke and Bobby Helgeson. So we're our so the soil science team, but then also plant physiologists. So Rosin Buchert um, is involved in crop geneticists um, who are all involved to try to work together to understand um, NUE. And so what we're ultimately wanting to know within the sort of big picture is we want to know what makes a spring canola plant nitrogen use efficient. So a lot of this work um, was actually sort of built upon some preliminary work that Sally had done uh, quite a number of years ago now, where she, where her, where this work um, suggested that there was a range in nitrogen use efficiency across a historical series of commercial and experimental canola genotypes, um, as well as differences in root responses among genotypes to different end fertilizer rates. So what these pictures here are showing are actually root images that were collected in the field using a mini rhizotron camera system. So essentially we bury a um, transparent tube in the field and then you can feed a camera down that tube and you can take images uh, very controlled in terms of 
where the images are taken over the course of crop growth directly in the field. And some of this um, preliminary work that Sally did back in 2013 indicated that, um, that there was different responses in root canola root growth um, for, uh, in this case, she was working with ACXL um, that, that, that indicated a different response to nitrogen, soil nitrogen fertility. Um, so that along with the microbiome work that we were doing with um, Dr. Siciliano and Helgeson is, is informing the current project in nitrogen use efficiency. So nitrogen use efficiency um, is, you know, sort of intuitively uh, rather simple, but it, but it's also actually quite complex. So nitrogen use efficiency, it can be expressed in many ways. So agronomically, it's most commonly commonly interpreted as the amount of yield per fertilizer nitrogen inputs. So essentially, how does nitrogen fertilizer translate into yield? But nitrogen use efficiency is actually complex and it encompasses two components. Um, the first is nitrogen uptake efficiency. So nitrogen uptake efficiency reflects how well the plant can acquire nitrogen from the soil. And this, you know, from the soil also means you know, fertilizer sources that, that have been input in the soil. The other component is nitrogen utilization efficiency. And so this reflects how the nitrogen, once it's in the plant, is partitioned and ultimately contributing to, to seed production to yield. And so uh, forgive my very rudimentary graphical design skills, but let's pretend this is a canola plant. And we can see um, how nitrogen uptake efficiency um, has a lot to do with uh, below ground processes. First linked directly to the plant itself through the root system and the root system's ability to physically access soil nitrogen and to take it up. Um, so thereby interacts with architectural and physiological root traits. Um, but and, and uptake efficiency is also more indirectly related to soil processes. So if you can see on the right hand side, we've got the um, processes involved in the nitrogen cycle, and there's many ways in which the plant roots can influence um, the, the transformation of, of nitrogen to forms that plants can take up. Um, and so we're really interested in breaking down these different components of nitrogen use efficiency. So ultimately, you know, the broad goal, um, the future goal here is, is really how can canola breeders redesign or select commercial hybrids that can be tailored for specific environments or to suit better um, nitrogen fertilization agronomic practices. Now, one thing that we do know um, is that, you know, selecting for high yield potential in modern um, canola hybrids has definitely improved uh, nitrogen use efficiency. And so, yes, that's that's known and that's understood. But but what our project is seeking to do is to um, sort of address how canola breeders can can harness these other traits to advance NUE even further. And so, one thing that we are kind of focusing in on with this project is that you know um, the canola response in terms of yield can be described by the whole plant including root architecture, and that this will respond differently to nitrogen availability. So we're really wanting to take a whole plant approach. And so research in other areas of the world um, has shown that there is natural variation for um, nitrogen uptake and utilization of efficiency. And this has been characterized in winter brassica napis, um, but it hasn't been studied yet in Canadian cultivars or just in general in, in, in spring types. Um, and so that, that's part of what we're trying to tackle here is to see if what has been found in winter uh, brassica napis is, uh, is also important in um, spring brassica napis. So what does this research um, encompass and, and look like? So the, the part that I'm involved with is, um, is related to field trials. It's a field-based study, and we've got two different sites. So one at Melfort uh, Research Farm and then at the Saskatoon Research Farm on, at Llewellyn Road. Um, so we've got black soil and brown, dark brown soil zones represented here. Um, and this project was started in 2019, and then it was repeated again last year. 
And so we grew eight canola cultivars um, under both low nitrogen and high uh, nitrogen fertilizer rates. We used urea here. And the cultivars encompassed um, hybrids as well as historical open pollinated cultivars, um, as well as founder lines, so the breeding lines that Sally works with. So the plant physiologists and uh, crop breeders took measurements of plant nitrogen uptake, um, partitioning and other yield and agronomic, agronomic measures to be able to actually you know, quantify, calculate um, the various components of NUE, uh, and as well as looking at root architecture using mini rhizotrons. And so if we look closely in at the plot here, we've got a this white tube sticking out of the ground, and that's actually the, the tube that we can feed our mini rhizotron camera system down and actually image the roots um, as they're growing throughout the growing season. Now, what my group is specifically looking at is we're focusing in on these root soil microbial interactions. And so my grad student, um, Joe, he's on the left here. He's working to identify if there's variation in soil nitrogen cycling processes, as well as um, functional microbial genes that are involved in nitrogen cycling. And so we're focusing in on the rhizosphere because this is where we expect plant-specific effects to be most pronounced. So he's still working through um, some of his samples. And of course, the last year with, with COVID restrictions, it has delayed, unfortunately, some of the, the data collection. But he does have sort of enough here that I can um, sort of present a, a bit of a, um, a tease or a, a, some preliminary results to see where, where this might go. Um, and so what he focused in on, again, is nitrogen cycling uh, enzymes that relate to nitrogen mineralization. So that'll affect nitrogen availability as well as inorganic nitrogen. Um, and so this first graph is focusing in on a specific enzyme. So it's NAG or N-acetylglucosaminidase. It's an enzyme involved in nitrogen mineralization. And, um, and so we've got um, on the right hand side here, the graphs showing um, NAG activity at Llewellyn and then at Melfort. And we've got, uh, we collected samples at the six leaf stage and at flowering. So um, before, you know, before maturity. And what we had done is we collected soils, um, the rhizosphere soils, so that's the soil that was in direct contact with the roots, but then we also collected soils between the rows of the plants, um, just to see if we can pick up that more immediate um, interaction, direct interaction between roots and the soil and then the soil processes. And so what we found or what Joe found is that roots accelerate soil nitrogen uh, soil nitrogen cycling, um, especially actually at the at the during the six leaf stage, and we actually thought it would have been more pronounced at flowering um, than at the six leaf stage, um, just because we thought that as the root systems grew over time, that there would be a greater input of carbon, which would accelerate um, uh, nitrogen mineralization and and enzyme activity, um, and so but this was actually you know, a good result in the sense that we were able to confirm that the roots did in fact impact uh, the soil nitrogen cycle. So when we looked more closely at the rhizosphere of the different genotypes, so now we've got on the top, we've got Llewellyn, on the bottom we have Melfort, and on the x-axis we have the eight different uh, cultivars, the, the different genotypes that we were working with. And so on the left hand side, these NAM lines are the, the breeding lines. And then we've got our, our hybrids to the right. So we've got a bit of a kind of a gradient, I suppose, um, in terms of the, the genotypes that we we're looking at. Um, and so what we found, uh, or what Joe found actually, was that there was greater and faster rhizosphere response under the hybrids. Um, and the open pollinated cultivar Westar here. Um, so we found that there was greater response at higher nitrogen for fertilizer rates. So the brown is the high end fertility and the, the blue is the lower end fertility. Um, so there is a faster and greater response under the hybrids and Westar at high nitrogen rates. Um, and then we also saw that the response to nitrogen fertility in the NAM breeding lines was actually 
delayed and not in, as pronounced. So if we look at flowering here, we can see that there was a response to um, nitrogen fertility, but that response was is rather small and uh, occurred later uh, in the in the in the growth stages of the plants than um, than in the open pollinated West Star as well as the hybrid. So what this in indicates to us is that there is genotypic variation in nitrogen cycling that is modified by nitrogen fertility. Um, and so we have some we just actually got the the soil uh, inorganic nitrogen results just a, a week ago actually and so just preliminarily here what we're seeing is that there's a lot of variation um, in soil nitrate availability in the rhizosphere uh, across these different plant genotypes um, and again you know at the two different stages there's quite a lot of variability but one thing that we are finding is that there is actually a a relationship, a significant relationship to nitrate, um, so soil inorganic nitrogen availability and enzyme activity. And so we're going to explore this um, a little bit more. So indeed, so we're seeing that enzyme activity is related to soil nitrate availability. And what we're speculating right now is that what is driving higher enzyme activities at these higher rates of infertility might also relate to changes in root biomass and architecture that could affect root exudation patterns. And so the obvious next step is to compare these root architectural and growth traits that's being collected through the mini rhizotron imaging system um, to, to see if that's related to our soil nitrogen cycling data. Um, and so there's, you know, there's a lot of work ahead to sort of piece together these various below ground components and relate that to the nitrogen uptake and, you know, ultimately NUE among these canola genotypes. And so I'm just going to finish by highlighting within the same project. So within this canola NUE study, I'm also uh, working with Dr. Bobby Helgeson, who's a soil microbiologist, and um, we have a co-supervised postdoc, uh, Yunling Li, and he examined the root and the rhizosphere microbiomes of these eight genotypes that were exposed to high and low rates of nitrogen fertilizer. And so what he found here, so if we look at this, um, this ordination plot, uh, now again, just a reminder, the closer together the points are within the plot indicates that the structure of the microbial community is more similar. And so what, what, um, what Dr. Lee found is that, um, for example, if we look here, the circles, are the root microbiome. And so that's the micro, microorganisms that are living directly within the plant root. And then we've got the rhizosphere microbiome. So those are the soil, the microorganisms that are living in the soil that's in close proximity to the root. What, we're, what we found is that the structure of the bacterial community within the root is rather uh, quite similar. We do have differences between Melfort and Saskatoon but that the root microbiome across, um, you know, is affected by, by site and affected by year, much more conserved, whereas the rhizosphere microbiome is quite, quite a bit different from uh, between Melfort and Saskatoon and that there was a, a stronger effective year season uh, between the two years within the Saskatoon site. So the root microbiome was distinct from the rhizosphere microbiome and that field site as well as year shaped bacterial community structure. Now, if we look, zoom in and we look more specifically at the different factors that affect the structure of the bacterial community, um, we found that growth stage um, had a strong effect and this isn't surprising. We affected growth stage to be important in shaping the microbial community. Um, so we, we found that, but then we also saw that canola variety um, affected community structure in at least three of the four site years. Um, and one thing that we hadn't necessarily affect or thought would happen was that nitrogen fertilizer didn't have any effect on the structure of the rhizosphere or the root microbiomes. And so we're, we're you know, still looking at this data um, and, and relating it to other soil properties, uh, like for example, the inorganic nitrogen data that we just that we just acquired, and then as well as other soil properties like soil pH that can actually have a strong effect 
um, roots can have a strong effect on soil pH, which then in turn can affect um, the soil microbial communities that are associated with those roots. So just to sort of wrap up here, um, you know, what, what I'm hoping that I've been able to you know, communicate is that the root form, so the root traits can affect soil functions and ultimately the fate of nitrogen and carbon through our soil systems. Root exudates can alter microbial communities and, and soil functions that are related to soil organic carbon, which is then related to organic matter, as well as nitrogen use efficiency. And so these have implications for understanding how does soil organic matter form? How can we keep carbon in the ground? Um, as well as for improving management of fertilizer use. And I think what's really critical here is that root research really involves multiple disciplines. So we need to continue to work, um, soil scientists need to continue to work with plant physiologists, with crop breeders, um, to be able to really unlock the hidden half of plants. And so I know I've been talking a lot about, um, you know, differences among different crop genotypes, but some of the other root related work that I'm involved in is looking sort of more broadly at a, more of a systems level. So looking at um, specifically at pasture systems and how root contributions uh, can, can help to sequester carbon in a pasture based system, as well as transfer of nitrogen between forage legumes and grasses. Um, and then also looking at, you know, within a cover cropping system where we're, the intent is to have a living crop root over a longer period of time, um, how does that affect um, soil biological properties that are related to soil health? So with that, I'd like to acknowledge all of, um, you know, the great team of students and, and researchers and collaborators that have been involved in all of this work. It is incredibly collaborative in nature, which is really fun to be involved with. Um, and then, of course, really generous funding from, um, you know, all of these funding agencies that have enabled this work to occur. And so with that, I will uh, thank you for your attention. And I think we've got a few minutes uh, left here for questions. And um, yeah, if anyone wants to get in touch with me, my email address is there. And um, yeah, looking forward to any questions that you might have. Thank you. I'll just maybe stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, Melissa. Very uh, good presentation. I believe Dwayne is going to handle the uh, Q&A. I don't have the questions in front of me. So with that, Dwayne, I'll turn it over to you for that portion. Thank you, Tom. And yes, thank you, Melissa. So we'll see. scroll back mm -hmm. through the chat because I saw a couple questions earlier. I know that Ross was asking about, were you doing any work yeah. in looking at the differences between annual and perennial systems? And your tail end slides kind of spoke to that, but. I guess uh, go ahead and uh, give us a little more than that teaser. Sure, yeah, absolutely. So um, looking at, at the soil microbiome diversity between annual crops and not within not within a, the same study, like we're not doing a, comp I, at least not yet anyways, um, like none of my current research is comparing annual versus perennial. Um, although I will say that some of the work that I did when I was a postdoc um, and I was working with Bobby Helgeson, we did some we did some work um, at one of the there's a trial at at Scott Research Station which looked at an organic system versus a conventional system and within that system there was there was two different well actually three different crop rotations so one was six years of um, different annual crops. So it was a, quite a diverse rotation, but it was all annual. But then one of the rotations had three years of annual crops followed by three years of alfalfa. So there was a perennial component to that. And um, we actually found in, in that in the work that we did there, we were looking specifically at um, at carbon and decomposition, uh, but as well as microbial communities. And yeah, we did find differences between the diverse six year annual rotation and the rotation that included alfalfa, um, as well as how that related to to carbon cycling. So yeah, I definitely encourage you to to look at that that work that um, that Bobby and I published a couple years ago on that. Um, but currently, no, I'm not looking specifically between the two systems. I do have some projects um, that are looking at uh, 
uh, again, like I said, a, a, a solely a pasture graze system where we're comparing different um, bloat versus non-bloat legumes. Um, and then as well as a grazing system down in Old Man on his back, um, uh, Nature Conservancy owned land where we're looking at uh, prescribed burn uh, on the native grassland and, and sort of how that interacts with grazing and then looking at soil carbon and, and the microbial communities. So yeah. yeah, thank you for that question. Thank you for your um, response. Um, so Michael was asking, what are you doing to prevent preferential root growth in the vicinity of the mini rhizotron tubes, which would in turn affect the root architecture? So how are you taking that into account? Yeah, Michael, that's a really, really good question because that that is like the number one concern or one of the limitations of using this method is, you know, not, not only could you potentially have preferential root growth, but then you could also have preferential movement of water um, down the side of those tubes. And so what um, so what we did in the first year of this project is we are are taking we took we literally you know take the images but then we also dug out all of those um, not all of them but we also took cores um, to be able to look at the root system architecture and also allocation of biomass um, with depth uh, just through that you know that weren't in contact with the mini rhizotron tube system so that we could compare and I, I don't have that data for you right now to see what the impact is on on that because um sally's student has been working on that and we just haven't seen i just haven't seen the data of that but yeah i think you're you know that's a really good question because it's not you know when we look at the limitations of some of these root methods that is one of those limitations is that it is hard to control for that and so one of the things that we do is we um we at least we try to install the tube not just directly vertical we actually try to install it um on an angle so that we're at least capturing different plants across that um across those images uh, and because it's also at an angle, it's the the path isn't quite as you know doesn't follow quite directly that gravitational force. But you're right, like it's it's still something that we're trying to get a handle on, and and so we're hoping that the 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 excavated roots compared to the images can at least give us some indication of what the the potential impact of any kind of preferential root growth might be. So yeah, good question. Um, and then I see Khalil was at trying to ask a question regarding the method of harvest and fertilizer. Did you find a difference in change in the microbial soil growth and the types of the microbes? So I'm not okay. sure which one he's, ref which, which project he's referring yeah. this question to. So we found that at least with the nitrogen use efficiency trial, at least what we're initially finding right now is that nitrogen fertilizer itself, like the nitrogen rate, didn't have a huge impact on the structure of the microbial community. So, you know, who was there didn't change all that much, but what we're finding is that what they're doing is affected by nitrogen fertility. So the higher rates of nitrogen fertilizer were corresponding to higher rates of nitrogen mineralization. Um, we didn't we didn't, um, I guess, change or alter how we harvested anything, so we can't really, you know, I can't really comment on on that aspect. But yeah, um, definitely impacts of of nitrogen in terms of processes. Um, but yeah. Okay. Uh, so and then Shauna had a comment about: Have you considered that there are differences between traditional grasslands? soils and uh, traditional boreal forest soils microbial communities differ yeah absolutely there's there's you know even broadly speaking we we tend to consider that forest ecosystems support a higher fungal relative to bacteria uh, community so yeah absolutely there would be there would be differences in microbial communities because we've just got different resources you know grasslands have fine roots and you know there's this sort of continual input of roots and in forest ecosystems we've got you know big large diameter tree roots um, a lot of the carbon is actually above ground you know within within the trees 
as opposed to being continuously pumped out into into the soil in the same way that we would have in grassland soil. So yeah, definitely um, differences. All right. Well, thank you very much for your presentation, Melissa. It's definitely exciting to see all the different soils and microbial population work that you're involved with. And uh, it definitely is an exciting field to be involved with in terms of the multidisciplinary approach that's required. So yeah, I appreciate absolutely. your efforts. Thanks. And yeah, Michael, I agree. We're doing, I'm doing some work with cover crops right now, um, but essentially one of the system more or less is an intercrop because we've got red clover that's going growing directly with the with the cash crop. But anyways, yes, I'll I'll stop talking and let you guys get on with the next session. <laughs> Thanks, Dwayne. No, we appreciate it very much. And uh, if there are a couple more questions, we do have a couple more minutes, but I thought that they were maybe slowing up here, but we'll see if another thing pops up here in the next.